Who are you looking for? We are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. Well, why do you seek the living among the dead? He was crucified. We seek to anoint his body. He is not here. He is risen. But we saw him nailed to a cross. Why are you ready for death, but not ready for life? We are afraid. Have no fear. Life has triumphed over death. O oh, grave, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is God's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. It was Easter Sunday, a mere two weeks ago, even though it didn't seem like it since we were for the second year in a row barred from gathering at church or any other kind of gathering. So like everything else in this stretched out pandemic, let's stretch out Easter into its full Eastertide, extended a couple more weeks, at least until the merry, merry month of May comes along. Now, last week, uh, you remember, Terry took a marvelously close look at, the extended, at an extended Easter, as reported in the Gospel of John. So I thought for the rest of April, we'd take a closer look at some of the other resurrection texts in the New Testament. I mean, there's so much there. The empty tomb, the rolled back stone, and the angels, or the young men, depending on what gospel you're reading at the tomb's entrance. Joseph of Arimathea. The women and the spices, the disciples cowering in the upper room or going back to Galilee, again, depending on what gospel you're reading. So let's dig right in. Here is the earliest writing we have in the Bible about Easter and the resurrection of Jesus. So listen for the Eastery details of the empty tomb. You know, count the angels. Listen for the business about the rolling away of the stone. Here we go. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. And then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Wait a minute, you might say. That's not the Easter story. But it is. It's exactly the Easter story and written by the Apostle Paul, at least 20 years and probably more before the earliest gospel was written. It's from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. This first Easter story has no empty tomb, no angels, no spices, no grave clothes, nothing Eastery at all. Here's another first person description of what may be the very same Easter experience, written not by Paul, but by the author of the Gospel of Luke, long after Paul had had the experience. While I was on my way and approaching Damascus, about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone about me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And then he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not hear the voice of the one who was speaking to me. I asked, What am I to do, Lord? The Lord said to me, Get up and go to Damascus. There you will be told everything that has been assigned to you to do. That's from the book of Acts. Again, written by the same author as the Gospel of Luke. Now, in his letter to the Galatians, Paul says that he had a, a numinous spiritual experience 14 years ago. So if the crucifixion happened in the year A.D. 30, just to pick a date, and Paul wrote this in A.D. 50, say, then his revelation of the Lord on the road to Damascus occurred about the year 36. 
long enough after the crucifixion for Christians to have developed into a movement and to have stirred up a backlash from the Jewish mainstream, of which Paul was an aggressive part by his own admission. Now, one more reading, this one from the Gospel of Matthew, which circulated in the early 80s after the total and utter destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans in the year 70. The Jewish world was now a very different place from when Paul was writing. Listen to this. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has been raised from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Finally, here's all the familiar stuff. The tomb, the stone, the angel, whose role is played by two men in Luke and Mark, the terrified women, the promise of an appearance of Jesus, and most importantly, the dialogue, which is pretty much the same in Mark and Matthew, but shortened some in Luke and John. But remember, this was written 10 to 15 years after the destruction of Jerusalem, which itself happened 40 years after the crucifixion of Jesus, when most Jews and followers of Jesus were no longer living in Jerusalem or Palestine. Now, I'm going over all this because it's very possible that the empty tomb was a later tradition than the actual experiences of the risen Christ. In other words, the story of Easter morning with the women going to the tomb and finding it empty may not be historical, may not have happened on Sunday, April 18th in the year AD 30 in a way that could have been filmed. The empty tomb experience may have happened later on subsequent years in April, just after the full moon of Passover, but maybe not on that first Easter Sunday. Now, after we sing, let me try to answer the so what question and explain why these little academic tidbits bolster and increase my understanding of the risen Christ. And maybe they'll bolster yours as well. Consider the words to this hymn based on Psalm 30 to be our opening prayer.
Yeah, joy comes with the dawn. Joy comes with the morning sun. Joy springs from the empty tomb. Well, see, I've, I've always had this problem, even as a little kid, with the empty tomb as described in the Gospels. And, and here's why. See if you resonate with this at all. When I was 12 years old, uh, my grandfather, who had been a coal miner in Germany, died of black lung disease. And instead of a cemetery burial, his body was cremated. It was my first experience with death. 1965. Now, I'd heard the Easter story and studied it in Sunday school. Jesus is killed on the cross. His dead body is laid in a tomb on Friday evening. Then on the third day, Sunday morning, that tomb is found empty. Soon after, Jesus is found to be alive, bodily, and his wounds can be seen and even touched by Thomas, although not by Mary Magdalene. That's all in John 20. Well, what assumption is a 12-year-old kid to make about this? That there's a connection between the missing corpse and the alive Jesus with his five wounds, right? Jesus is alive. The dead body can't be found. Ergo, the dead corpse revived, resuscitated. Well, okay, my 12-year-old self could handle that. It's a miracle. It's the supernatural power of God. But the minister at my grandfather's funeral, the very one who preached at Easter in my church and who taught me the Easter story, spoke of resurrection over the burned up ashes of my grandfather's body. He taught that Christians go to heaven no matter what happens to our bodies, our remains after death. Okay, But then he also taught that the empty tomb proves Jesus' resurrection. And my preteen mind is thinking, turning in circles and loops. So which is it? Does the Easter revived body thing mean my grandfather couldn't be res resurrected since it was burned to ashes? Or, okay, okay, his body was cremated just a day or two after his death, so all the, like, molecules were still there. Well, unless some of them went up in smoke... But what about all those people who had died long ago and their bodies decayed away to nothing? Could God get all the atoms back to the right bodies? And what if some of the atoms had been reused in the meantime? Which resuscitated body got them at the resurrection? Or did God arrange for all the bodies with the reused atoms to just go to hell? You can see the trouble you can get into when you connect corpses or ashes with spiritual resurrection. You quickly get into bizarre conundrums, fit only for drunken BS sessions in university dorm rooms, or if sober, fit only for forensic, forensic details for coroners haunting basement morgues. If we can disconnect the empty tomb stories from what happened to those followers of Jesus right after his death, that stuff goes away. And we're left with something much more refined and mature, which is what churches like ours are all about. So here's how I deal with this 56 years after my grandfather's death and after witnessing, I don't know, Scores and scores of other deaths. Now, if this doesn't help you, just forget it. It's just one way to look at the resurrection and not the good news of the realm of God itself. It's an important point. If this doesn't work for you, just forget it. Okay, here we go. There are two separate traditions in the gospel about Easter. One includes the experiences of the risen Christ after that April Sunday in the year A.D. 30, give or take a few years. The other one is a separate empty tomb tradition. And we see this in its primitive state in Mark's gospel, which doesn't have any resurrection appearances at all, and ends in its earliest version with Mary Magdalene and the other women going to the tomb and finding a young man dressed in white who tells them, Jesus is not here just like in our call to worship this morning. 
What happened, I believe, is this. Some disciples close to Jesus had had overwhelming experiences of the risen Christ, and these stories made the rounds quickly among his followers, who then had similar experiences themselves. The Apostle Paul himself mentions in the earliest Christian writing in existence that Jesus appeared to 500 different people at one time, long before his own personal experience. So what had been devotion to Jesus as his teaching when he was alive in the body turned, because of these experiences, to awe, to an indescribable vision full of both humility and hope. I myself have had such an experience, and many of you have as well. We know the spirit of Jesus is alive, and it has nothing to do with a resuscitated corpse. Now, we also know, hang in with me here, we also know from the Bible and from centuries of Jewish tradition that the Hebrews revered special holy places associated with divine revelation. Abraham raised an altar when God first spoke to him. So did Jacob when he dreamt of the angels going up and down a ladder to heaven. The temple in Jerusalem was ground zero, so to speak, for the worship of Yahweh. There's plenty of other examples. If Jesus appeared to the disciples, or more properly, the disciples had the experience of the risen Christ all over the place, Jerusalem, Galilee, on the road to Damascus, where would these geographically oriented Jews put the special holy place, the place of worship? Jesus' body, his remains, of course, could not be found. He was a political prisoner of the incredibly cruel and oppressive Romans and a local from the backwards North Country besides. As a rule, a crucified body either would have been left on the cross to rot and be eaten by scavengers, or in an act of unmitigated humiliation, taken off the cross and tossed in a common grave in Gehenna, where both garbage and the bodies of criminals and traitors were burned outside of Jerusalem. Even if the body of Jesus had been buried, it's debatable if his followers, who'd fled to Galilee in fear of their lives, could have ever located the actual burial or disposal site. I know we don't think about this stuff very much, but we need to dig into this on Easter. So where did the early Christians celebrate Easter? With what specific place did they associate the wondrous event of Jesus' resurrection, which was more real than real to them? Well, they simply went back to the last place they saw Jesus alive, at the old stone quarry just outside the walls of the city, near the Damascus Gate of Jerusalem, where he was crucified, along with uh, the other thorns in the side of the official temple establishment and their Roman overlords. Crucifixions were held there by the gate precisely so that passing traffic could see the bodies in various stages of composition, hanging there with signs proclaiming their crimes against Rome. The ghastly horror of it was the whole point. Now, if you've been to Jerusalem or if you've uh, read books or seen pictures, you know that Golgotha, the skull place in Aramaic, the historically attested probable crucifixion site, and the supposed tomb of Jesus are very near each other. In fact, since the 4th century AD, they have uh, both been under the same roof of the Church of the Sepulchre, this massive ancient building behind me here. Here's an interior view of the tomb site. And that's another thing that's bothered me for years. It seems so unlikely that a rich man like Joseph of Arimathea would have a tomb so near a known execution site. It's just improbable. So, here's what works for me. 
between the year 31, say, and the year 70, when Jerusalem was utterly destroyed, those early Christians celebrated resurrection right there in that stone quarry and crucifixion site. The Romans were relatively tolerant of religious activities as long as no rabbles were being overtly roused against the emperor. Maybe Joseph of Arimathea was the one who funded the carving of a tomb out of the quarry wall next to the crucifixion site, not for burial purposes, but for memorial purposes, or better put, for liturgical purposes. Since Jews were prohibited by the exacting purity laws to enter a tomb, any tomb, with a decaying corpse in it from the third day after death until it had decayed to the bone, a new tomb would have had to be used, one that never held a body. Thanks to Joseph of Arimathea and his uh, many shekels, one was provided. Now, can you imagine a ritual, a ritual procession in those earliest years, like a proto-Stations of the Cross, in which Psalm 118 would be sung. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Can you visualize an offering of worship in which Psalm 22 would be chanted and placed in the mouth of Jesus? But I am a worm and not human, scorned by others and despised by the people. All who see me mock at me and shake their heads. For dogs are all around me. A company of evildoers encircles me. My hands and feet have shriveled. I can count all my bones. They gloat over me. They divide my clothes among themselves. And for my clothing, they cast lots. And what was the liturgy, the drama that they played out there in that grim place? Imagine a young man in a white robe who intones, Who are you looking for? And the people, maybe just the women among them, answer, We are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. And the man in white answers, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is risen. He is not here. In other words, because Jesus is alive, as many have experienced, he can't be found in a tomb, in a place of death. The wisdom he preached, the realm of God he lived in and taught, is deathless, ever-living, ever-vibrant. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Why are you looking for Jesus in a cemetery? He's not dead. It's liturgical. And the key to all this is that the experience of re resurrection came first, and the empty tomb, the memorial tomb, came second. The empty tomb wasn't proof for skeptics. Faith didn't come from an empty tomb any more than an empty coffin would do it for us. In fact, it could well prove the opposite point. After all, in the Gospel Easter, Easter stories, the women who go to the tomb and find it empty aren't convinced by this proof, but instead run away in fright. The empty tomb story exists to assure those who already believe that their faith doesn't depend on mere physical evidence. So let's finish up for today with another step. After the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70, and followers of Jesus who, Jesus who had had this ineffable experience of the risen Christ were scattered all over, the 40-year-old stories needed to be written down. So this liturgy was simply lifted and placed into the various Gospels, beginning with Mark. The details varied somewhat depending on the communities, the uh, individual churches, so to speak, just as we might expect. Those who were still around from the earliest days knew what was meant. But as they died out, the empty tomb story was taken to be historical, to be the thing itself. 
See, I don't think the first Christians ever thought much about the corpse of Jesus or ever believed that his body had been laid in a new cut tomb next to the crucifixion site. The original experience of Jesus' resurrection had to be something other than that. I mean, something happened to these people, something so consequential that they were willing to give up all that they had and all that they were up to and including their very lives because of it. Well, what was it? What was it? It's that experience that I want to speak about next Sunday, and it's very galvanizing stuff that I'm very excited to talk all about because all of us can have, if we haven't many times already, the same experience. At Easter, the hymns and anthems all proclaim that Jesus is no longer in the tomb. I don't think he ever was. It's all so much more powerful and life-changing than that. So tune in next week and get the rest of the story. Amen.
In the name of the risen one, let us pray. O oh God of life, everlasting, eternal, deathless life, you shatter all the familiar tombs we create for ourselves. You enable us to move beyond slavish conformity to either old understandings or to new fashions. And joy prepares us to embrace your ever-changing, ever-challenging future with joy rather than fear. Thank you for giving us moments of amazement, for helping us to accept the rhythm of the ordinary and the extraordinary, so that each of us can have a steady awareness of your presence, both in dark days and in bright days. So now, in this third decade of the 21st century, Help us and all human beings to let go of those mental pictures of you which prevent us from accepting that we will never know you fully. Save us and all human beings on this beautiful and frightful camping trip that we're all on. Save us from pointless theological argument which reflects our insecurity rather than your mystery. We cry out for everything in the world that needs mending and for strength and hope to do our part. We ask especially that the world be rebuked, chastened and loved into rediscovering the true purpose of this existence here in time and space, to live in divine love and to grow up into spiritual maturity. In the name of Jesus, victor over death, victor over sickness, and announcer of your eternal realm, we pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may all of us, no matter what we're afraid of, or how much our bodies may ache, or our finances may be fragile, or how lonely we are during the pandemic, may all of us be open even now to the wonder of life. May we meet the true self beyond the pain and loneliness, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>